Grace Sawyer Goyle Have. Welcome to Goyle Have. Uh, today with me, I am incredibly excited to have um, two wonderful translators um, from Chinese to English. Um, first of all, we have the translator Nikki Harmon, who is the translator of Yan Yangge, um, Dorothy C, and Han Dong. <laughs> I was just just making sure I got everybody's names in there um, and especially other than her work translating she also does a lot of work promoting Chinese literature and a little bit with the Leeds um, Centre for New Chinese Writing. I also have Helen Wang who is a translator and especially translates children's books. She's sort of the go-to person um, for translating Chinese children's books into English um, and it's an absolute joy to have them both here today with me um, to talk a little bit about Chinese children's literature. Thank you so much for both coming along. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Not at all, I absolutely loved, I cannot say how much I enjoyed um, reading these two books in particular and we'll sort of come on to focus on the books um, after a little bit but I just wanted to say both of these were absolute joys to read. I it was a delight um I really got swept up entirely in both of them so um thank you very much for your work translating those um, so Nikki first um how did you come to get into translation and how did you end up with this being your passion job anything you'd like to call it I, uh yeah so um it was happenstance, really. I was doing admin work in universities and I really dropped my Chinese. I mean, I did Chinese a long time ago. I kind of dropped it. And then one day I got asked to translate a bit from uh, someone's memoir. And as soon as I began the translation, I knew this was what I wanted to do. So that was all very straightforward. I absolutely loved it but making it into a job was a lot more complicated. So about 25 years ago, I did my first novel for actually for an agent who then sold it to a publisher and it was by Hong Ying and it was called K, The Art of Love. And I, knowing nothing and knowing no other translators or how the business works, I just sat back and thought, oh, that's all right. The translations will come rolling in. But of course they didn't. And it took many more years while I got to know publishers, writers, other translators. And eventually the work did build up. And then about 12 years ago, I decided to give up the day job, which is the most scary thing to do. And most people don't, some translators do, but a lot of translators have another job on the site. Um, yeah. So I've gone on from there and I do mainly fiction and thanks to Helen who introduced me to some children's authors. I have begun to do a few children's authors and, and I love it. How about you, Helen? How did you come to specialize in Chinese children's literature? Well, I started, I did it in, in Chinese in London in the 1980s. And at the end of it, so I translated a few short stories and essays that were published, but it never occurred to me that you could actually do it as a job or as a career or anything like that. And so I went away and did lots of grown up things. And sometime in about 10, 12 years ago, I happened to meet Nikki, who happens to be the cousin of the husband of one of my colleagues. And she said, you, you two might get on. So we met and we had a cup of tea and then we had lunch and we had a drink and we had a over several days or several months, we got to know each other. And I started wondering, well, I wonder if I could do translation again. And uh, Nikki and I became translation buddies. And so if anything, Nina, uh, uh, Nikki was kind of like a mentor and a friend and the sort of person who you could fire off ridiculous things in the middle of the night and she'd wake up in the morning and go, oh my goodness, she's at it again. And, um, and gradually it moved from there. So some short stories and together we founded the the China Fiction Book Club. And it was at one of the China Fiction Book Club meetings that Nikki brought along the suggestion um, that uh, a publisher was looking for translators to publish two children's books and to do them quite quickly. So I thought, well, I'll have a go and see how it happens, see how it works. And I was offered the commission, at which point I 
had to freeze because I thought, how do I manage my job and my family and my everything else that's going on in my life and translate this book very quickly. So anyway, I did it. And like Nikki, think, oh, I've done one. When's the next one going to come? And it doesn't. You know, it's like a one bus wonder. And yeah. then gradually you accept the situation that it just, you know, it's it's up to you to see what happens next. And um, and then I was very fortunate to be offered bronze and sunflower, um, which I did. And uh, so things kind of snowballed from there, which has been very nice. So a lot of it is thanks to Nikki. Oh, well, you introduced me to children's literature, which I don't think I would ever have dared have a go at. <laughs> so it's been a mutual. What is it about children's literature, Nikki, that you wouldn't have dared touch? You know, can you explain a little bit about um, what the difference is, what it feels like to translate adult and to translate children? Um, well, of course, I read books to my own children, but I didn't know if I had a voice that I could develop that would appeal to children. And I, I once read something very nice um, on one of these literary websites, which went, children are the most unforgiving readers. <laughs> no, they will not read on beyond the first page just because you tell them it's worthwhile. It, it has to grab them. So in a way, they're the best readers, but they're also quite demanding readers. Um, I think I, I kind of prefer from uh, age 10 or 11 upwards, I, prefer the slightly more grown-up children, the full-length novels. And I actually really love the children's stories. I've had the privilege to translate. I mean, we can talk a bit more about that later. But I think that in many ways, children's and young people's literature in Chinese is more accessible to Western readers. Um, there's a kind of burden that attaches to a lot of grown-up literature and what the writers want to do and are trying to do. And somehow the children's literature just seems more straightforward. You know, they tell a damn good story. Couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, Helen, how did you end up sort of specialising? And you mentioned Bronze and Sunflower, which is by Xiao Wen Chen. Shen. And, um, you know, it's it deserves every award it won and it was obviously a little bit when you say it snowballed it snowballed in this way because it became quite popular um so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and how you came to specialize in children's literature particularly um well so I'm quite picky about what I translate and if I don't like it then I tend to turn it away and it may not be because it's it's not necessarily to do with the quality of the book it's just simply whether I want to be spending months, sometimes years of my life with a particular story. And so when, when I was doing Bronson Sunflower, as I, was, as I was reading it, I was reading it at my mother's house. My mother was very ill at the time. I was there with my sister. So I would disappear and read a chapter and then come back down. They say, oh, what's happened? Oh, something dreadful has happened. There's been another saga. And the plot was that every chapter, something absolutely horrendous and unbearable happens. And so, you know, and, and then she cried. So it became a little bit of a kind of, oh, well, this happened, what, what's happened now? And then she cried because she, she cries quite a lot, but she's very little. And, you know, the things that happened are really quite traumatic. And so when it came to translating it, um, it wasn't just the plot and, and then she cried. It then became, the more I did it, the more I did it was actually the humanity of the story came out is that they're faced with these impossible choices. I mean, who, Two children in the river, who do you rescue? Do you rescue your son or your daughter? Those kind of impossible questions, almost in every single chapter, there's a dilemma like that. And you, you, you come to understand from, from their point of view, from the character's point of view, why they're making the decisions they're making, why they should choose, why the family should choose to send sunflower to school rather than bronze, why they should make these decisions. And so, you know, there's a lot of humanity in that story that came forward, which was just, at the end, that was really what shone through, which was quite different from when I first read it. Mm. And then from there, I was then, the publisher, the publisher in China of that book was very keen for me to do more. So I've done some more for them, including Dragonfly Eyes, which came out this year. And then uh, one or two other people got in touch and asked if I would, if I would 
be interested in doing either samples or to do some, some picture books. So I've done some of those as well. And then again, thanks to, thanks to Nikki actually, um, one publisher got in touch with Nikki and said, Nikki, would you like to do this book or would you like to do this? Um, what was it, Nikki? It was, um, there was one book that you, one story or one book that you'd, you, you were asked, would you translate it? And, and you said, well, actually, Helen's already, Helen's already done, done this as a, as a kind of a, for fun or for in her own time. Uh, I don't remember what it was now. I don't remember which one it is either, but I think that really shows how translators help each other. We're such lovely people. <laughs> we so have Nikki, a really good community. Well, well, at the time, Nikki said, oh, Helen doesn't do children. No, I don't do, Nikki must have said, I don't do children's books. Ask Helen, she's just someone. So the publishers <laughs> asked me, would I do it? So I did this picture book. And then we met up and we had a cup of tea. And he says, oh, is there anything else you're interested in? Which was a very nice question to be asked. It doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> Um, and I said, yes, I, you know, this one that I've, I've read, which is called The Ventriloquist Daughter, which is really for teens rather than for children. Uh, it's a little bit dark. And he said, oh, yes, I like that book, do, sh book too. Shall we do it? And so that was how that one came about. But that was, that was simply over a cup of tea and it was completely by chance. And mm. it's very nice when those things happen. Mm. Often you have to work a lot harder to get the commissions. Mm. You clearly have a very genuine interest um yourself if you're sort of seeking out and reading um which i think is you know something we should all um do is read more children's books that they're great <laughs> like just full stop like there's definitely you know should not be um any sort of it should be a part of um every adult's regular reading um but how did what what is it about children's books that um draws you in in particular uh me or um, either or <laughs> yeah, go ahead go ahead um, okay, so is this a time when I could talk about a couple of my favourite children's books? Thank you. This would be a lovely time in which to do so. Right, okay, so um, let's start with this one, which I think I have, I have been to thank for. You put me on to this. So this is... Um, I want to be good, which this is the Indian edition. And um, so I've sent you the cover of the UK edition. Sadly, it's not yet out in the UK, but it should be out this month. Huang Beijia, and she's another very well-known children's writer. And I took this on and I thought, well, this is really my first excursion into young readers, a full length novel for young readers. And it's all about school and it's all about maths exams and it was all a bit of a rush so I didn't actually read the end till I just started I jumped straight in and thought what is this going to be like but um, I really greatly rate this this writer Huang Beijia she has a way of making a kid's ordinary school life exam pressure friends uh, having silkworms as pets so lively and so funny and you can probably see from the front cover she's quite a chunky little girl and so her mother thinks that if she puts her on a diet it will improve her brain power this is the one of the problems that in china the pressure on the parents is huge because the children have got to get through their exams so the whole family goes on a diet and it's hilarious and she has a wonderful way of making this little girl's life extremely funny and just no holds barred. So I loved it. And um, after that, I did another book by the same author uh, called Dra um, uh, Light of the Bumblebee. <laughs> Flight of the Bumblebee. I was about to give the name of your book. Yeah, um, <laughs> Flight of the Bumblebee, which does indeed refer to the piano piece it has a lot of music in it and um, it's a wonderful wartime story about a big family in Chengdu during the war and it's a, if anyone has seen or read a testament of youth by Vera Britton it's like a younger reader's version of testament of youth I mean it's it's tragic but it's beautiful and uh, I just think this is so accessible to Western readers, especially young readers. Um, 
And then we've got a completely different author, which is the one you held up at the beginning, uh, White Horse by Yen Go. And this is a quite a dark novel. Uh, in fact, I think they call it novelette, a novella, um, which was shortlisted for the Warwick uh, Prize for Women in, in translation. And that is totally different. It's about a, a girl who finds out about her family when she's a teenager and has real difficulty in coping with some very dark secrets that come out. And the white horse is either, depending on your viewpoint, is either her savior, her protector, this white horse appears in her imagination or else it's a rather more sinister manifestation of her own mental health. And uh, so I love that as well. And it's a totally different kettle of fish. Um, with white horse, I felt, it is it's it's stunning it's absolutely stunning um and i felt like one of the things it captured very well was that tension um between teenagers and adults when sort of um the expectations of adults don't maybe reflect the fact that you know teenagers are are not adults yeah and then also that the teenagers are trying to understand the adult world and are coming into conflict with that world and very real violence ensues from that. Um, how was that to translate? Was that um, difficult? Well, I think um, Yengo has, I mean, both this and another book I'm going to show you, although it's not for younger readers, it's very much for adults. So these are both by Yengo, The Chili Bean Place Clan and White Horse. Um, both of them, narrated by very young narrators. So she's seeing these things through the eyes of a child. And specifically in White Horse, it is about a child growing up. The Chili Bean Paste clan is much more about the child observing the adults. Um, and I think she somehow softens it. She makes some really horrible things acceptable because you're seeing them through the eyes of a child. And it's, she doesn't always use this uh, technique but I, I think it means that some things which in adult fiction could be construed as really brutal, really male chauvinist, misogynist, uh, really quite corrupt and horrible, um, are somehow softened because a child is seeing them and a child is interpreting them in both cases, it's a girl, through her own eyes, in her own way. And I find it hard to be any more specific than that, but I, I think it's a way she deals with brutality, which is, works particularly well for younger readers. It's not too much in your face. It's very honest, but it's not too much in your face. You can kind of understand whatever you're ready to understand, maybe in a way. Yes, exactly. There's lots in there for adult readers as well in White Horse. There are things that adults will pick up on, like the way the cousin walks, waddles along at the end of the story when she's got a boyfriend. And an adult would think, oh, she's got pregnant. And the child might not pick up on that, or might. It doesn't matter. It's up to them. Absolutely. Um, Helen, um, sort of something I've heard before about translating picture books is actually um, all sorts of problems that might not have occurred to other people come up. Like um, if if you if you change the translation in a certain way, the illustrations might not make any sense anymore. Um, there might be rhyme. There might be sort of a, a meter. Um, what's it like translating picture books? And I was wondering if you could talk about some of your favourites as well. Um, okay, well, with picture books, the the text and the pictures have to match, and if they don't match, then there's a problem. There was one book, I don't know if I have it here in this book. No, I don't have it here. There was one book that I did, which um, the whole story hinges upon a little boy who's born, he's born special, he's born with um, special markings on his body, and that eventually leads to him being, you know, being a, a leader. And in the picture, there was no... The, the, the boy's body was shown, but there were no markings on the on the body. So I went back to the publisher and said, I think really we have to have the markings on the body. Could you ask if the illustrator would 
put the vacuums on so we can see them. So, you know, sometimes it's it's in the original, there's, there's a, maybe I perceive a, a mismatch or, and if there is that, then it's a question of just raising that with the publisher and saying, do you think there's something here that we need to address? Sometimes it can be that um, uh, the, the language is kind of very specific. Sometimes it's, as you say, it could be rhyme or it could be very bouncy or it could be very, very gentle and very calm or alliterative. And it's a question of how do you put that into English? And sometimes it works beautifully and it's no trouble at all. And other times it's just, it just niggles and niggles and niggles and niggles and niggles and just will not go away. And the things that look the simplest like nursery rhymes are an absolute nightmare to translate because they are packed with cultural reference and they are packed with sound. And so, for example, in the Bronze and Sunflower, there's a little song, this one that the grandmother is singing to the little girl. And this was the hardest thing in the entire book to translate. And it's just four lines, it's maybe 20 characters, something like that, or 25 characters, 20 characters. Very, very difficult to translate. And I think we went back and forwards about a hundred times with the, the publisher, with the editor. And you know, every time I go back, she says, no, no, it doesn't quite work. It doesn't quite work, it doesn't quite work, it doesn't quite work. And eventually I went for a very, very long walk with two dogs. I thought, okay, it has to work in my head. And I said this, these four lines, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until they stuck and then I went home and I wrote it down and she said yes that's fine that'll do so you know it, it it's a question of if you have too much information how do you make it sound very simple and how do you make it you know the rhyme is not always a difficult thing it's how do you make it all fit in in the right kind of way that sounds completely natural um so that was that was quite a difficult thing to do with that one but um uh Sometimes when I'm translating, I will I will kind of scan the scan the picture book, and I'll put it into a into a PowerPoint, and I'll try and put the English on top because then I can see how it fits or it won't fit. Because sometimes you know the words, if the words are really long, are they going to are they going to look good? Are they not going to look good? And although the layout is ultimately the publisher's decision, um, while I'm doing it, I find it useful to work very closely with the pictures. Um, what is it um what sort of is unique um linguistically to Chinese as a language and sort of therefore also there are unique things about English as a language um are there any places that you noticed um them sort of butting up against each other or there's some something that can't quite work in each language um sort of Helen first and then Nikki one of the things that I find difficult is I find names really difficult, personal names very difficult, and place names. Because in, in Chinese, there'll often be a, you know, there'll be a meaning behind the name. So for example, so Nikki, Helen, Caitlin, you know, we have the names that we're given, but, you know, and we, we may know what they mean, but they're, they're, they're fairly regular kind of names, whereas in Chinese you can, you can create any names you like. And sometimes there will be there will be there'll be a sound to them, sound element. Sometimes there will be a visual element in the characters. And sometimes in the story there will be lots of interlinking. And there, you know, there'll be codes within the story that are linked in the names. So I'm translating a story at the moment where the names are absolutely essential. And I have no idea how I'm going to do it in English because it works in Chinese, but I, I don't know how it's going to work in English at the moment because it's all. There are lots of puns and there are lots of twists and turns and I suspect that there may be a case of I get the joke too soon because I'm thinking of the name phonetically and the reader might read it and see it visually and may not sound it out and if they don't sound it out they may not get it so I'm toying with all of these different things at the moment so those things are quite I find quite tricky they're also uh, it's a little bit like doing cryptic crosswords if you get it it works and you feel good about it and if you don't get it it just just gets under your skin <laughs> until eventually either you do something about it or you leave it. Nikki. Well, yes, I mean, David, we could go on forever with examples like that. I think I, I'll instead, I'll make a kind of, I totally agree about names. Names, especially authors that give their characters names that you know they've given them with intent, that the, the intent is to suggest to the reader that that person is a certain type of person and so on. It's so difficult to deal with them. But besides, there's a whole tradition uh, that says you mustn't translate names. But actually, then if you don't, especially nicknames, 
then you lose that whole layer of meaning. And Chinese is not the only language. I often see translators forums where people translating from Spanish through English or any other language are talking about the, the same problems. But I, I think the broader comment that I'd like to make is that the languages are so different and the key to a good translation is to get absolutely as much in there as you possibly can. But then give yourself a bit of time, read it again, and try to spot the skeleton of the Chinese syntax. Take it out. We don't want any skeletons. We don't want a reader who knows Chinese to read it and say, oh, I know what the Chinese said because that's the way the English has come out. And my goodness, it sounds awkward in English. So somehow you've got to be very faithful to the content, but you've also got to produce something in English that reads fluently in English and particularly for young readers. Well, for all readers, I think. Uh, and dialogue, you know, the mark of a, of a serious translator is someone who can really deal with dialogue. Dialogue has got to sound like someone's actually spoken it. I mean, unless the Chinese protagonist is actually giving a speech, in which case the English um, translation will sound like they're giving a speech. Mostly, you've got to look very carefully at dialogue. You've got to make it sound like dialogue. If you've used words in your translation that don't sound like anyone would ever say them, then your character is just doesn't sound convincing anymore. And the reader's going to be turned right off no matter what age they are. Um, I'm going to disagree with one aspect of what Nikki has just said, is that, yes, it must read well at the end, and it must read, you know, it must, it must read genuinely. Um, but when it comes to translating and removing the skeleton of the Chinese, I don't always agree with that, because to me, sometimes what I try to do is, if I can, I try to get as close as I possibly can to the Chinese without, you know, not being stilted, but um, because sometimes there are there are things that are expressed in the Chinese way that actually are just perfect, and there isn't there isn't an exact English equivalent. There's maybe one that's similarish, you know, with a similar kind of intent and a similar kind of meaning. But the the way it's expressed and the way it's described is just it's kind of like magic, you know. And if you can if you can get that, then then it it really works. And it doesn't always work. And if it, if it doesn't work, then you then that's the worst thing. That's that just makes it absolutely dreadful. And yes, you should remove it. But if you can make it work, actually, you're bringing something really, so really from another language into English, and you're really kind of creating something that's that's new in English. It's not new in Chinese, but it's new in English. And if it works, it's brilliant. Um, it's really hard to do that, but it's it's a it's a genuine pleasure when it when it's possible. Yeah. No, I I I really agree with you. I think that sounding stilted will do. Translate standing stilted is awful. But but the whole thing is like you do your translation and you're constantly going backwards and forwards between the original and what you've translated. And the process continues sometimes after publication. I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and think that was what I ought to have said. <laughs> Too late. The book's been published now. Okay, Nikki, I'm <laughs> just I'm just uh, I'm just going through the, the the edits for the American version of Dragonfly Eyes. Dragonfly Eyes, actually from, from, from first reading to publication this year took actually quite a long time. So now to, and I've read it as part of the process because it took a long time, I read it so many times now, rereading it with, you know, slightly adjusted for the American reader. Um, it's just like, oh my goodness. Oh, 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 is that, what, is that how we said it? Is that what he did? <laughs> and it, it's it's very peculiar and it's it's the same it's the same kind of feeling um I don't know Nikki have any of your books been made into audio books um I think yes but I haven't listened to them I, I really should because that's the test isn't it to see what it sounds like Bronze and Sunflower it exists in two audio versions one in Australia one with one in Australia and one in America and um it's it's very very strange listening to a story that you've translated that you spent months translating and editing and getting ready for publication being read aloud in somebody else's voice because it's neither the author's voice 
nor is it your, you know, the author's Chinese voice, nor is it your English voice of the author's translation voice, but it's somebody else's voice in another, from another, you know, from an Australian or American accent, reading your UK English version or your American version of a Chinese author's, and it's so weird to listen to to it that it's it's just so peculiar. It's, you know, the only thing I can think of is like when I was, uh, when I was about. In my early teens, my older brother had been to America for a year. And when he came back, he was all grown up and his voice had changed. Oh, and it was just, it's just like, he's my brother and I love my brother and that. And everything about my brother is, you know, he's my brother, he's my brother. But the voice, it's not his voice, his voice has changed. And it's that kind of feeling, it's just weird. Um, so, you know, this, this question of voice is actually, it's, it's, it's quite important because if somebody writes in a voice that you don't happen to like, it's quite difficult to read it. Mm. And I, uh, going back to your point about allowing the Chinese feeling to come through, I still think skeletons, I'm talking about something which, it, which is stilted and where the syntax of the Chinese has come through where it shouldn't have done. But I think your point about producing something Chinese in English is, is, is a really nice one. And, uh, and that's one of the joys of reading a translation that you get that you get the feeling of what the original background was and you get it through the language. So I'm agreeing with you. Okay, I agree then. <laughs> uh, bronze and Sunflower is a really good example of that naming issue because the, their names have, you know, uh, those aren't um, names that would often crop up in an English language, um, but work so perfectly and are so important to other aspects of the story. And again, if you hadn't translated those, you I wouldn't have been able to access that meaning. Um, a really different use case from sort of the traditional, like, oh, keep, a, keep as much as you can um, name-wise. I think that's so interesting. In, in, there's another little story of that because if in the Italian translation of Bronze and Sunflower, the title isn't Bronze and Sunflower, the title is Sunflower. Mm. Because the editor thought that the word for bronze in Italian sounded too rude, so they didn't want to put it in the title. Um, and so you know, it, the, the translator was furious and said, no, 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 it, it's that's the title it must be integral to the story the whole it, that's how it works together and in the end um you know they argued the toss and he lost <laughs> so on the front of the italian book there's a great big sunflower and the title sunflower but you know the, to all translations you know when, when you're translating you're working with unless you're publishing it yourself you're working with somebody who's commissioned you to translate or is going to publish it and they they have a say in, in what happens as well. So, you know, when you when you hand in the translation, it's up until that point, it's all your own work, or you're responsible for everything that's gone into that so far. When you hand it over to the editor, the editor will then, you know, you hope will go through it very carefully and pick out anything that doesn't sound doesn't sound right or that they question or they um, have a reason to want to change. And you know, it, it's quite a it's quite a tense moment when you hand over your baby to the to the editor say, well, here's my baby. This is as much as I can do with it. You take it from here. And they come back and say, well, you know, let's put it in, let's do this, let's do that, let's do the other. How about this? And you, you know, you just hope that it's going to, you're going to agree on most things and they're not going to try and uh, do something that is quite drastic. Um, because actually, if, you know, then you have to check it against the Chinese, which takes time. You have to go, you have to revisit it. And the editing process is, the editing process is really, is really important and it can really lift, a, lift a, a translation. But it's also a lot of work for everybody. It's a lot of work for the editor and it's a lot of work for the translator. Mm. Um, I, always, I always think it's sort of a very important thing to spread the word that sort of editing has such a big impact on a book and is such a big process of a book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, and also for the for the for the publisher, you know, publishing is it's a commercial it's a commercial business, and you know they they need to take a product to market. So you know it's it has to work for for them as well. I was wondering a little bit about um I am presuming, but I don't actually know um that both of you are translating from Mandarin and sort of um that variant of Mandarin. I, I'm afraid I don't remember much. I was actually wondering. 
um, if you could talk a little bit about the languages in China and sort of um, what gets is there is most is most literature translated from Mandarin? Um, is there sort of you know a hierarchy there um, that could do with a little bit of <laughs> widening all that kind of conversation? Um, maybe Nikki and then Helen this time. Um, yeah. Okay. So this one, Yen Ge's Chili Bean Face Plan, is actually written with a lot of dialect in it, and there are, and I trans I often translate writers who use dialect to a greater or lesser extent. And there are some who use even more dialect than Yenge, um do. And on the whole, it's, it's not really a difficulty because if I come across an expression that is uh, obscure to me, then for sure it's obscure to lots of Chinese. And so they write, they write on, their, um, on the internet, you know, can anyone tell me what does this mean? So then I find out, I read it, oh, that's what it means. Or of course I can ask the author. I, I think that it's really hard to talk about Mandarin in terms of a literature. I mean, it's just Chinese. It is standard Chinese. You get the variations when you get authors who use dialect. You get variations when it's authors who are from Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan as well. So there are more variations in kind of style and particularly in dialogue um, than there would be in English, although English and American is pretty different too, in British English and American English. Um, and so, yes, I mean, uh, Yenge uses dialogue, to, uh, uses dialect to great effect in her works, not so much in White Horse, mm -hmm. but definitely in Chili Bean Pace Clan. And she's received praise from other Chinese writers for doing that. It's recognized as an enriching way of writing. So I think there's, there's a, definitely an openness in China to reading different dialects of Chinese, different regional variations. And of course that begins to merge into each author's particular style. It's quite hard to draw a line and say, that is the author's style on the one hand, that is the use of a dialect on the other. Um, yeah, other non-Chinese languages within China, that's a slightly different thing, Tibetan, Uyghur, and some of the other languages. Uh, personally, I don't tend to get offered those for the very good reason that I couldn't possibly do them, um, because they are different languages. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a nice question to think about. How about you, Helen? Have you got anything to add to the, that very comprehensive answer? Well, I'll just, I'll just um, I'll tell you a little more about the book I'm translating at the moment, which is, it's set in Shanghai, and it's, um, it's, it's about uh, a little girl and her mother from a small town who turn up at the villa, you know, the very expensive house of a rich family in Shanghai. And so you have all the different contrasts of rich and, rich and privileged and you know, very mannered and coming from the countryside where everyone's a little bit more straightforward and direct, but everyone's trying to be polite to each other. And you have the father, the father of the rich, of the rich family, the father is very, he's very measured. He's an editor in a publishing house and he's very measured and his words are very measured. And then you have the housekeeper who is, the housekeeper is morally upright, but has the most foul temper and you know, loses her cool at any, you know, the, the slightest provocation. So there's something very strange going on with her. Then you have the mother who's flounces about all day doing not very much at all. And you have the little girl who's been brought up by the housekeeper to be completely morally upright. And so she's frozen half the time. And then you have the little girl from the countryside who is completely direct and just says whatever she wants to do. So the voices in this combined with lots of Shanghai slang is, um, it's, it's kind of, every time I, I look at it, it's, it's, uh, it's just a joy to do because it's so, it's so complex. <laughs> um, it's probably very easy to read in Chinese, if you, you know, and very fast, but it's quite complex to put into English and to capture the different voices in the different ways and, you know, the, the different kinds of vocabulary and the ways in which they're speaking. So um, I'm 
about three quarters of the way through, hoping that that will, hoping that it will work in the end. It is really very difficult to give an idea of dialect when you're translating into English, because on the whole, well, firstly, I don't have a native dialect that I can use, but also publishers really frown on making someone from Xi'an sound like he's uh, a Glaswegian bus driver. It just doesn't work. So somehow you have to indicate that that person is using dialect um, or is speaking in a different way or is being, as Helen says, being more direct and more outspoken. And you have to do that with the use of standard English. I mean, one thing that I find really difficult is when I've been told not to use British English slang because I think British English slang is such a rich resource. Uh, when you're translating dialogue. Um, but of course, American publishers find that hard in the same way as I sometimes don't understand American English slang. So, you know, the balancing act goes on all the time. Absolutely. Um, I was just wondering if um, you wanted to, either of you to mention any other books um, in case I've missed any at all. And then also to speak a little bit on um, is there something, um, I think something I feel about both of these books is um, that they actually both deal with sadness and that that's a really important thing for books to sort of deal with and sort of convey and for us to explore in this way. And um, that, um, you know, there's sort of the, there's an experience in there that I can relate to even when there are many experiences in there which I have never experienced. Um, and I was wondering if there was anything you wanted to say about um, Chinese children's literature, um, maybe not as a whole, but in your sort of experience of it and um, some books that you've interacted with. Uh, let's go Nikki Helen again. <laughs> right. uh, yes, well, uh, I mean, on the theme of sadness, I mentioned a book which hasn't yet come out, but I finished translating it, Flight of the Bumblebee, which I hope will be at the end of this year. And it's the ultimate sad book about children in wartime. And it really, it really does remind me quite strongly of Vera Britton's Testament of Beauty. Uh, and, but it's not sad all the way through. There are very funny things that happen. Um, so that's what I would say about sadness. I mean, about my other work, I'd really like to invite people to look on Paper Republic, which is a registered charity website promoting Chinese literature in translation. Sign up to our newsletter. Just see what's out there. Uh, books by Helen, books by me, books by all sorts of other people, uh, authors that you've never heard of. Um, uh, it's a really good resource, so it's paper-republic.org, and uh, I think there's so much more I could say, but so much of it is on the website. Take a look at it. I couldn't recommend the website more. I personally have found it very useful, and um, it's really, really a lovely resource, and you do such good work there. Um, Nikki is on the sort of, the board of, is a trustee, I believe, and sort of, yes, <laughs> and it's so... It, the, everybody there works so hard at promoting Chinese literature and um, it's really fantastic. If anybody like does have, um, we don't charge for these events, um, but they do cost something to put on, but like we would really like um, if you could, if you are able to um, donate any money to pay for a public um, for this event, we would really appreciate that. The links are down below in the description. Thank you. <laughs> Not at all. How about you, Helen? What about sad? Shall I flash some books that people can buy? Yes, please okay. do. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that more and more books from Chinese children's books are being translated into English. One of the, the issues that I bang on about all the time is that visibility is very low. If you go into a bookshop and browse, you won't see. If you go into a library and browse, you may not see. So if you want to do this, kind of go online, um, go to our website, there's three of us, we, it's called Chinese Books for Young Readers, a very boring title, but it works, Chinese Books for Young Readers, and that's myself, Anna Gustafsson-Chan, who is a prolific translator from Chinese to English in Sweden, 
and Minjia Chun, who, is, uh, who works at the Child Specialist Children's Library at Princeton University. And between us, we do a lot of things on there. Um, and if you don't see these things in your library or your bookshop, ask for them because they can buy them or you can buy them online. It's not difficult. Um, another thing I'd like to say about Chinese books, children's books, is that actually they can be very, very silly and very, very funny. You know, we've talked about sadness today, but actually there are some hilariously, as one of my colleagues would say, underpants on your head kind of silliness. I mean, just really, really, really silly and very joyous as well. Um, this one, Vivid Jumps, is about a little frog who can't stop jumping. Um, and he jumps, jumps, jumps all the time. And he has all these different escapades. And he has a little sister who, grow, when the book starts, she's a tadpole. And by, you know, then she grows into, into a little frog. And she's the sensible one who is a lot braver than he is. So you know, it's a little bit of lots of fun there. This I one, love the as well. Lay Along the Library Bus. So if you can see that, Lay Along the Library Bus is about a, a, a dinosaur who takes little children to a, little children to story time at the library. Um, but he's too big. For the library and so it's actually what happens um, uh, in the story that's a really nice one to have that's in paperback as well these two this one which is a festival book um happy mid-autumn festival that will be usually in about september um this was uh one of the translation was one of the translation competition texts for the lee center for new chinese writing and this book was translated by i think she was 15 or 16 at the time by jasmine alexander um, it's a lovely, lovely story with the rabbit family and how they make mooncakes. And this one, also by the same author and the same illustrator, Sleepy Sleepy New Year. This was translated by a 13-year-old. It was uh, same, it's the same competition from the Lead Centre for New Chinese Writing. And this is about a bear who wants to know what Chinese New Year is like, but has no idea. And it's just lovely. It's just beautiful illustrations. This has got these two books have got English. So it reads like a normal English book, and then um, Chinese Chinese version at the back. So you can read them both if you want to read them both. Um, there's this one, Little Rabbit's Questions. This is a, a available in English or a bilingual edition, but a little rabbit who never stops asking questions. Mama, why? Mama, why? Mama, why do you have big ears? Why do you have big feet? Why do you have a big tail? And so on and so on and so on. It's just lovely. And the illustrations, this is another thing to say about the Chinese children's books, is that the illustrations are sometimes just fabulous, just really gorgeous. Oh, I love that style so much. Um, this one, the artwork in this one, Express Deliver Delivery from Dinosaur World. This is an activity book. And masses of details. And at the end, you know, there's the dinosaur eggs. Who designed this one? These are all different artists behind them. That's a really gorgeous book. Um, Lemon Butterfly by Tao and Shen, which is a very, very colorful book about a butterfly and where it goes on its adventures. The artwork is just amazing. This one, picking up on Chinese traditional textile designs, Ash dresses her friends. And Ash, this little pigeon or little dove, dresses her friends like this. Oh. <laughs> There's another one by Tom and Shen, Feather, Feather, you know, Feather that wants to know where it belongs. So at the moment, there are a lot of books that are coming and that are available in English. And if you don't see them, you have to ask for them, but they're there and they're available. Um, and I would, if you, if you like any of them, I would encourage everybody to leave feedback wherever you can, whether it's stars or hearts or uh, messages here and there, because that's how, you know, word of mouth spreads. So people like something and they tell somebody else. So it's it's a question of visibility, really. It's it's there. It's coming through. Uh, if um, if you want to actually see the books, the Guanghua Bookshop on Shaftesbury Avenue has a very good selection you can browse through. And of course, thank you very much for inviting us today to come and show off a little bit. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, it's all, it was an absolute pleasure to have you both. And um, I'm going to be buying those picture books. <laughs> I think I'll be pretending they're for a friend's child or something. And actually, I think they'll just be for me. Um, so. <laughs> if, you, if you want the details of these books, then have a look at uh, Chinese books for young readers. And, you know, often we'll give some of the background as well. So you're not just buying a book that is completely cold to you. 
perfect that will be linked all down below as well for everybody um thank you both so much nikki and helen for making the time to speak today um i really appreciate it and thank you everybody for watching um if you'd like to see any more of our events in particular any more of our children's focused events they are all linked down below you can see the rest on our youtube channel um so thank you so much for watching um if you do have the ability please do donate to pay for a public um for all the good work they are doing um and thank you both very much goodbye thank you so much bye